All right, everybody, we're starting with 2.03 financial accounts. So we've probably all heard about people hiding money under the mattress, but is that really the safest place to put your money? Um, we've all, if you lived here a few years ago, you all went through Hurricane Ian and a whole lot of homes were flooded. It'd be a shame if that money floated away. All right, so you have a couple options when it comes to financial institutions. The first one is a commercial bank, and the second one is a credit union. They operate very similarly, but they are a little different. A commercial bank is a for-profit company. That means they are in the business of making money. So uh, it includes services like savings and checking accounts. They really make a ton of money off of loans, car loans, mortgages, credit cards. A credit union is a nonprofit organization. It provides very similar services. You can still have a checking account, a savings account, a credit card, loans, all that stuff. However, usually there's some sort of membership um, you need to be eligible. There might be a military credit union. Um, one of our local credit unions used to just be for teachers. I believe it's now open to everybody, but there used to be memberships or there are memberships for some of them. So what is better? It's really gonna be up to you. Both of them are insured by the FDIC. Let me take that back. Both of them are insured. Commercial banks are insured by FDIC up to $250,000. I'm not gonna say per account um, because it really is more connected to the person, but the FDIC has lists and rules and all that stuff. So just make sure you understand what that is. The credit union is insured by the NCUA, also up to $250,000. A wide variety of financial services. I'm gonna say that advantage is on both of them. Uh, better access to technology due to their larger presence. That one could be true. And then, because they're bigger, there might be more branches, more ATMs, more online services. However, credit unions often offer lower fees. And sometimes they either offer a lower minimum balance or no minimum balance. I don't believe you should have to pay to have a checking or savings account, but you have to follow the rules. In a commercial bank, the minimum balance to avoid a fee might be 200 bucks. In a credit union, the minimum balance might be 15 bucks. So obviously it's easier to have a free account at a credit union than a free account at a commercial bank. If you dip below those minimum balances, you might have a fee or you might have your account closed. So it's important, going back to the contract lesson, it's important that you understand what the rules, the terms, all those things are so that you can avoid having your account closed or fined because you didn't have enough money in there. There are typically higher interest rates, but I would say do your research. I have found sometimes credit unions have the higher interest rate, but sometimes the commercial banks do. And you might get lower interest rates on your loans. Again, shop around. You might get a better interest rate at a commercial bank than a credit union. Credit unions just typically have lower interest rates, but when you are getting a loan, you want to do your research because you want to get the cheapest loan um, that you can. A disadvantage would obviously be kind of the opposite, higher fees at the commercial banks, higher interest rates on the loans and lower interest rates on savings accounts. Remember, interest rates is the cost of borrowing money. When you are the one borrowing money, high interest rates are bad. When you are the one putting the money in a savings account so the bank can borrow it from you, lower interest rates are bad, okay? Um, so if it's a credit union, if there's not a lot of locations, then it's gonna be hard to use the ATM. I don't know if that's a big deal anymore because I don't know that a lot of people have to go to the ATM anymore. You can use your debit card at the store instead of going to the ATM, getting cash, and then going to the store. But it could depend. There might be fewer services. And of course, you have to, some credit unions, you have to be eligible. And now we have online banks that don't have a physical location. They are only operating online. 
Customers can transfer money, deposit checks, pay bills, apply for loans and credit cards, all online without going into the place. You still can get an ATM card to withdraw cash. Um, you would either just have to find one of their ATM cards or withdraw it from the grocery store or pay a fee to go to another ATM and withdraw money. I would avoid, I avoid paying fees when it comes to using money. I mean, of course, if you're borrowing money for a loan, you're going to pay a fee. But if you're just trying to withdraw cash or have a savings or checking account, I don't think you should be paying a fee. I think you should shop around and find a place that is still reputable, has a great um, presence in your community, but is free. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm going to say an advantage to this, even though it doesn't say it, is that they often have even higher interest rates on savings accounts because they're not paying for locations to be there. They're, they're just operating on the web. So Sarah has decided to go with a traditional commercial bank because she wants easy access and the ability to go into a branch. A branch is just a location, one of the, one of the locations for the banks. Um, let's see. Okay. So a checking account is designed to keep your money for easy access. I don't know anyone who really writes checks anymore, but when you have a checking account, you can spend the money in a checking account by writing a check or by swiping a debit card or by going into the bank. The funds can be deposited in the bank and they can be withdrawn by the bank holder at will, meaning when you want of course, when the bank is open is probably important too. You will typically not earn interest on it. And if you do, it will be very little because this is kind of like your, this is your spending account. We're going to get into savings account in a minute, but the checking account is your spending account. You, they may charge a fee to open or to maintain the account. I'm going to tell you right now, don't do that. Go find a checking account somewhere that will give it to you for free. Often there are free student accounts. Just be aware that when you are no longer a student, that fee may start. So just make sure you understand the rules at that bank and when those fees are going to apply and then close your account and switch to something free before that happens. These checking accounts allow the account holder, you, to withdraw cash easily and it's easy to use debit cards and checks. However, you have the potential for identity theft because someone can skim your debit card or someone can get your checking number off your check and then write fraudulent checks. Again, I'm not sure if that's really a thing anymore, but it was a thing a long time ago. There's even a movie about it. All right, savings accounts. These are the accounts where you're putting your money to not spend, okay? Often they are linked to your checking account so that if you spend too much in your checking account, the savings account will, will kind of, pull over into that account to cover anything. But typically the savings account is the money that you are not going to spend. The checking account is your spending account. The savings account is your savings. You are able to earn interest on this money and you can still access it. It's just a little bit harder to withdraw. And I do believe most savings accounts have rules on how many times you can deposit and withdraw from them in a month. So it's not like you should be, a savings account should be saving. So you really shouldn't be withdrawing more than two or three times each month because it's not meant to be spent. The checking account is where you want to put the money that you're going to spend that month. It does require a minimum balance typically, or you're gonna get a fee. There may be a fee to open and maintain the account and still has the potential for identity theft. A certificate of deposit. We call them CDs. Well, you guys don't really know what the musical CDs are, but these are money CDs. It is when you agree, it's like a savings account, but you're agreeing to put it in this CD and keep it there for a certain amount of time. So when you open the CD, it might be a six month CD. It might be a one year CD. It might be a five year CD. Whatever terms you were agreeing to, that's how long you're agreeing to keep your money in there. They will have the best interest rates usually compared to a traditional savings account. Maybe not better than an online savings account, but they are, 
if you're worried about online banking, CDs typically have a better interest rate than a savings account. However, you're locking your money away for a certain amount of time. If you take it out early, you will be charged a fee. There is a minimum amount that you have to invest to open a CD. Can't open a CD with $5. Like you might need $100 or $1,000. There's even jumbo CDs that might be $100,000. So just keep that in mind. These are a very safe way to keep the money safe, but it's also hard to get out until your term is over. As soon as your term is over, very easy to get out. And then there's a money market account, which is kind of a savings and a checking account mixed together. They often, high, they often offer a higher rate of interest, um, but a money market is typically, um, it's typically a higher balance. Uh, let's see. The, uh, okay, so it's typically better interest rate than a savings account, but maybe not as much as a certificate of deposit. If the money is taken out early, you might be charged a fee and there may be a minimum amount that you have to open the account. All right, so if you need to compare the, them, you can kind of go through here. I would, I would do your research online. Look at different banks, the local ones, the ones that are close to work or the ones that are close to your house or the online ones and see what they offer. Uh, make sure they're free or make sure you understand that like, I might have a checking account that is not free, but as long as I have a minimum balance of, let's say $500, then I don't get charged a fee. If I go under $500, then I'm going to get charged a fee. So keep that in mind. It's free to me because I'm going to keep, I'm, this is all just a scenario, by the way, but it would be free to me as long as I always have more than $500 in the account. So just look for different free accounts or ways that you can keep it free. So in order to open an account, you're going to have to have some sort of state issue or federal issue ID, a passport or a driver's license or a state ID card. A learner's permit card would work too. Basic information such as your birthday, your social security number. If you don't have a social security number, a tax ID number and a phone number. If you're under 18, a parent or a guardian would need to sign any documents for that account. And if you're having anyone else on the account, you would need the same information for them. Although I'd say be careful about putting anyone on your account. All right, so you need to pay attention to the interest rates. You wanna make sure that you're earning money on that, on your money. You wanna make sure you understand the minimum balance requirements. Okay, so in this case, if her balance dips below the minimum, she will be charged a fee. On average, that fee is $5 a month. Who wants to pay extra $5 if you don't need to? So make sure when you find out what that minimum balance is, that's your zero. If you're supposed to have a hundred bucks in the account at all times, never spend that hundred dollars. If you have $200, you can spend a hundred of it, but don't spend 101 or you're going to get charged $5. So keep track of your money. We already talked about that with the budgeting. This is, this goes hand in hand with that. Please be aware of monthly fees. Are there any service fees? Are there any out of network ATM fees? So if you have an account with Bank of America and you decide to use a fifth third ATM, you're going to get charged to use that ATM because you're not a fifth third member. So just keep that in mind. Be careful about using out of network ATMs. Excess transaction fees. So in this situation, if you withdraw more than six times from your savings account in a month, you're going to get a fee for using it too many times. I think that number's high. I think it's actually three times, but I could be wrong. Double check your accounts, your savings accounts. What I would recommend is when you make your budget and you have your money, you put your money in your savings account, and then you're like, okay, I'm going to get to spend $200 this month transfer one time $200 to your checking account and that's what you get to spend. Keep in mind, if you have that $100 minimum balance, you'll have $300 in the checking account, but in your mind, you only get to spend 200 because you have to keep that other 100 in there 
to avoid that fee. Wire transfer fees apply to most banks. If you were buying a house um, and you had to transfer a lot of money to buy the house, typically what would happen is the money would get deposited in your checking or savings account and then the bank would wire the money to the mortgage or to the house, however that works. So there is typically a fee involved in that. I don't know if you can avoid that, but you need to know what it is if you ever need to wire money. And then this is the one that you should always be able to avoid, insufficient funds fees. So if you have $200 in the bank and you spend $250, they might pay the $250. Now you owe them $50 and you owe them a fee, but they also might say, nope, we can't let her pay that $250. So you still have the $200 in your account. Whoever you tried to pay 252 didn't get their money and the bank is going to charge you a fee for trying to spend more than you had. And then there's the overdraft fee, which is the one I kind of already said. So if you have enough, if you don't have enough money, but the bank says, oh, you know what, we'll cover it for her. They're going to, again, charge you whatever the overage was and then charge you a fee for going over. So don't do that. Follow your budget. Managing accounts. Okay, so we've got the withdrawals, the money you take out. You've got the deposits, the money you add. And then you have the balance, which is what you get after you add and subtract it all. So this would be, this is kind of a typical checking account statement. So you've got the date and what the balance was. So we have $200 in our checking account. And then we immediately took out 50 bucks. So now we have 150. A couple of days later, we got paid $624. So we add 624 to 150. And now our balance is 774. Then we went out to eat. We spent $35. So we subtract 774 minus 35. We get 739. Then we pay our cell phone bill another $50. So now we subtract 739 minus 50, we get 689. Then we go to the grocery store. We take 689 minus 125, we get 564. Then we went on a shopping spree and got some clothes. We subtract $300, we get 264. We get paid again. We add that there. Then we withdraw 40 bucks from the ATM, we get 848. Ooh, we had to pay rent, $950. Uh-oh, I didn't have $950. I only had $848. So now I am over $102 and they charge me $30 for being over. So now I don't just have to pay the $102, I have to pay $132. 30 bucks is a lot. I mean, that's like going out to eat right there. So you really got to be careful. That clothes shopping spree was not necessary. You could have bought $100 in clothes, not $300 in clothes. So you had to find $250. Well, you had to find at least $132. But let's say you deposit $250, you're back up to $118. So you spent $1,580 and you deposited $1,498. This is a good way of tracking your spending and your deposit so that you know. Now, you would have known this was a web payment, meaning you probably have it auto set up to pull out on the 26th of every month. So you should know a couple days before that, you need to make sure that your balance is above $950. All right. So you can go back and watch this three minute video on spending and savings. All right. So let's look at some of the agencies in charge of keeping you and your money safe. There's the Federal Reserve. All right, this regulates um, the proportions of bank deposits that can be invested and the interest rates for loans. Um, you often will hear about the Fed interest rates Let's see, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. 
that's part of the U.S. Treasury, and it makes sure that the banks are following the bank laws and bank regulations. We have the FDIC and the NCUA. Okay, know what these terms are. These are important. And next time you walk into a bank or a credit union, you should see signs that say FDIC or NCUA. And it protects up to 250,000 per institution. So that, I think the last time we saw this, it said per account. Per institution is more accurate. So if I have uh, $250,000 at Bank of America and $250,000 at Fifth Third Bank, I can be protected at both of those places. But if I have 500,000 just at Bank of America, and if something happens at Bank of America and they go bankrupt, they're gone. I'm only getting 250,000 back because that's what the insurance covers. So why would I keep more than that in one bank? You've got to split it up. Also, if you have more than that, you should probably be doing something other than keeping it in a savings account, but that's for a different conversation. So uh, just keep that in mind. It, the government, if something ever happens to that bank, if it, fall, if it fails, if it closes, if it goes out of business, the government will re reimburse your money up to the 250,000. So if you have $2,000 in Bank of America and it goes bankrupt, the government will pay you $2,000 back. Okay, and if you want to do your research on this, this is really all about the Great Depression and what happened. And then these institutions came about to convince the public to trust the banks again. And then the last one is the Securities and Exchange Commissions. It's protecting investors. So um, when you're buying stocks or any of those publicly traded companies, those companies have to follow certain rules so that the people buying the stock understands the real financial health of the business. All right, we're almost done guys, this is a long one. Okay, although there are laws and institutions to protect us, there is still fraud, which is deceptive and illegal sales practices. Be careful, do your research. Okay, uh, let's see. Okay, regulations are the government laws that control businesses. The Bureau also works to educate consumers about their rights and responsibilities. So if you feel like you've been, um, and you feel like you're a victim of fraud, please make a claim to the FTC so that they can look into it and see what, um, what can be done to prevent it in the future. Okay, in 2007, the FTC found that about 97% of work from home advertisements were scams. Remember, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably isn't true. Okay, your turn. You can go to page nine and you can work on some of answering some of these questions. And then you can go to the pace chart and you can download the template for the one point, I'm sorry, 2.03 assignment. You can download the template right there. I have it already saved as a Google Doc and you can answer these questions. Step one, step two, and step three, and step four. Please make sure that you are answering the questions in complete sentences. You guys have a great day. Let me know if any questions come up.